Hello and welcome everybody to the United Suicide Survivors International webinar. I'm Sally Spencer Thomas, and I will be helping facilitate our webinar tonight on young people share DBT skills, real stories of surviving and coping through suicidal crises. And I just wanna give you a little bit of a background on what United Suicide Survivors International is all about, or as we like to call ourselves, United Survivors, or if you abbreviate even further, us, because there's nothing about us without us. We are a, an international home for people with lived experience, kind of across the spectrum of all different types of lived experience. So suicide loss survivors, suicide attempt survivors, thought survivors, support people. If you self-identify as having a lived experience with suicide, you are welcome in our very big tent. And our mission is really about lifting up our voices for um, uh, cultural and uh, societal change. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit more about our programs and some of the things that we do. Thank you, Sally, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We are very proud uh, to bring this panel to you and to learn some really important things. United Suicide Survivors International believes that we have to have these voices of people with lived experience, whether that experience is as a loss survivor or as someone who has struggled against suicidal intensity or someone who has survived a suicide attempt. And our goal is to come together and to work together towards advocacy, collaboration and leadership uh, to start to change the tide and the conversation around suicide. Some of our programs, one of the ones I'm most excited about, I hope you'll check it out, is our storytellers uh, courses that you can find online um, that really helps people to shape their stories in a way that's going to focus not just on all of the hardship and tragedy, but more importantly, how they found their ways through that. Uh, it's very, very, very important to pay attention to how people find strength in hard times. Sally, turn it back over to you. Sure. Um, and so I just have a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording and the edited, slightly edited version of this recording will be posted on YouTube and also on our website, um, probably within a week or so after this is over. Um, we will be uh, taking questions um, and comments throughout the, the program, but probably not getting to them till the very end, but go ahead and park them either in the chat or the Q&A function. Um, participants are all muted, but that's how you can communicate with us. And we really encourage you to check out United Survivors, unitesurvivors.org. And I will turn it now back over to Ursula, our board member, to take it away and introduce our panelists. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen because I want to show you something that is pretty brand new and um, I'm very proud of which is the content that we're going to be talking about today is now on the Now Matters Now website. And I'm going to start by introducing the panelists, our experts of the evening. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about the project at hand. So um, I've been working some time to create a leadership group of young ambassadors for Now Matters Now. So young people willing to talk openly about their experiences with mental health, substance problems, suicidal thoughts, and how they use coping strategies such as DBT skills to get through those times. And fortunately, um, a generous funder came into our lives and helped pro provide the funding that we needed to create these videos. The, um, what happened was I met with, the, with Natalie and Flora and Abby individually um, for a month, two weeks to a month. And what we did was prepare to do this video series where they practiced telling their story, they refined them, and um, we talked you know, in depth about, you know, what kind of messages they wanted to get out, what was important to them. So I'm going to start first by introducing Natalie. Um, Natalie, I'll ask her to say hi in just a moment. But Natalie is uh, been struggling with severe depression, social anxiety and self harm. Um, that started actually fairly recently, but with DBT, so dialectical behavior therapy, um, she's now survivor of suicide ideation. So through her own hard work and dedication, she's living a very happy life. 
um, what she wants to do, and there's a theme you'll see in our panelists, is she wants to go to college and major in art, and she wants to do um, an artist as a sort of animation films. So she's very open about her mental health and wants to help others, and that's the other major theme is just this really this strong desire to help others through their own experience. Natalie, will you say hello? Hi, everyone. <laughs> so glad you're here, Natalie. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Next up is Flora. Flora Medina is um, has struggled with depression, anxiety, and self-harm from a young age and is a survivor of suicide ideation. So with the hard work and continued use of DBT or dialectical behavior therapy, uh, she is now a college st student studying fashion, and she hopes to destigmatize mental illness and share what she has learned to help others. Um, would you say hi, Flora? Yes, hello. <laughs> Thank you. And Abby Richards is a suicide ideation survivor. She struggled with issues like bipolar disorder and substance use. And through DBT, she's um, overcome and, and lives a life worth living today. I really love that phrase, uh, life worth living. Um, would, you, would you say hi, Abby? Hi, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Hi. Okay, great. What we'd like to do first is show you an example of a video from this video series that I was telling you about. And um, we'll put the link in the chat so that you have access to where to find these videos. But right now where we're on is Now Matters Now and we're under the team tab. tab. Um, what we're going to do is go back to the main page, which I hit this center button. And what you'll see is there's a new panel on the far left, our young ambassador panel. Tips and advice from young people who've been there. You can actually share on social media um, about this page by clicking that, and I'm, I'll do that right now. Um, but the main point here is you watch a series of videos. And the way that these are organized is by, um, by name. So you see the four ambassadors that we have, Lily, Abby, Flora, and Natalie. Um, and we're gonna watch Natalie's video first. This is a video describing um, what it's like, what caused suicidal thoughts, what led up to them, and what the experience was like. I'm Natalie. I am 18 years old. I am very passionate about art. I love drawing and painting and sculpting anything artistic. And I've had suicidal thoughts. One of the first times I was actually suicidal was here in this room. And I think I was actually sitting at that desk. Thankfully, I didn't tell myself I actually want to die. It was the feeling like I want to die, like not if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, yeah, I did say I don't really want to be here anymore. And um, yeah, I, I remember I was like, I, my head was just like, I, I just didn't feel like myself at all. I felt like my soul left my body almost. And I was like, um, I don't think it's worth it. Growing up, I received a lot of recognition for my art and for how hard I was working academically. And unfortunately, a lot of people saw that as competition. And due to that, they put me down a lot with severe bullying. And um, I thought, you know, working as a unison in band would be, um, because at the very end of the day, it's not like it's all about this person or that person. It's about you as a whole, as a band. But people didn't view it like that. Whenever I got an award or recognition, people would see that and compare that to themselves because they would want that award and recognition. I mean, who wouldn't? And they would bring me down and be really mean to me and say nasty things about me behind my back. I've always been super critical to myself, always growing up, and to have that weight on me from others, it was so devastating. I remember I I just didn't feel like 
I didn't feel like myself. I felt like I was numb and nothing. Yeah, I didn't feel like a person. I just felt like dirt. Um, and I was like, man, life is so stupid. And I just, I literally did not see, you know, I saw some hope in the future, but I didn't see too much. Um, I just thought for the rest of my life, people would judge me and bully me. So I remember I had my first thought, like I never had it before because I never felt that way before. I, they made me feel like I was nothing and they would pick on me as if I was like a punching bag. For personally myself, I never got to the point where it was, I wanna kill myself or I'm gonna die on this day or make a list or a plan to act on that. It was the feeling of, oh my gosh, I literally don't wanna feel like this anymore, this horrible feeling. I wasn't thinking about taking action and taking my own life. It was the thought of, I didn't wanna feel this horrible pain anymore. Sometimes I had urges to harm myself to feel that pain and relate to that pain. Uh, we decided to hide sharp objects so I wouldn't be able to act on those urges. The moment I decided to get help was when I realized I couldn't live like this anymore, being so depressed and hard on myself and fearing my life every single day with the fear of judgment from others. One of the things that I wanted you to talk a little bit about, our panelists to talk a little bit about is when I reached out to you, you know, what was it? What was it about the project that made you say yes to this project? So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, Flora. So this project of sharing your sort of most intimate experiences um, and the way that you struggled through them. Um, what, what about that was compelling to you, Flora? Um, I think just knowing like how much work I had put into living my life again and actually enjoying my life while knowing how many people struggle with suicidal thoughts and all of the things that I experienced um, made me want to share everything that I had learned and that had actually worked with me um, with others so I can try and help other people. Do you know, how do you see this like being part of your life in the future? I mean, um, or what do you envision would be most helpful for young, for young people? Um, is there um, one of the things that I really liked that we did for the website was talking about specific times that we've used these skills to kind of get through a crisis and get help from others. Um, because I think one of the biggest things for me when people were trying to teach me different coping skills was not necessarily believing that it would actually help me, but hearing specific examples from someone who has like experienced very similar things would have helped me a lot to really trust that that actually could work. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that that's really a big part of the idea. Um, what about for you, Abby? Like, what was compelling about it, um, you know, being involved in like a project like this? And how do you see it being helpful to others? I think it was really cool that I was able to share some of the things I've learned along the way and like potentially help someone who might not necessarily know the things that I do. Um, and I think that's really cool because I definitely didn't have someone in my life that was like had experienced a similar struggle or like knew what to do in these situations. So I think it's a really cool resource for people who are younger to like look at and know that like, you're gonna learn a lot and it's gonna be okay. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah, the people like many of us don't have examples of success of like, how do you go about doing this? 
And if it turns out you can find someone like that online who has that expertise, that'd be really nice. Natalie, what was compelling for you? Um, something that really made me say yes to this project was the fact that um, when I was going through this time, I didn't have really any resources um, and I just had to just fight it alone. But um, I'm just glad that Now Matters Now exists and it's a resource for those who kind of went through similar stuff um, um, between all of us uh, that um, they will have the resource and tools to use. Um, you know, I would search stuff up on YouTube and on the internet and I related to basically none of it. So um, hopefully um, someone can relate to the videos on this website. Great, thank you. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so next um, we're gonna watch a, a video by another ambassador uh, named Lil, uh, named Lily, and um, she's going to talk about uh, one of the ways to get through. So let's watch that. Lily also has an Instagram show called Mind Wide Open. There was a period of time where I was having really severe panic attacks. It was right before I started college, uh, which is an intense transitional time in anybody's life, um, but was a year after I had lost my dad to suicide. Uh, and was feeling very lost, still very much in the grieving process, and had just experienced suicidal ideation for the first time myself. Um, so it was trying, you know, fathom trying to go to college and like start my life, uh, and had a really, really bad panic attack. And I was alone in my apartment and was really afraid that I was going to jump off of the balcony. And I was sitting in my room, afraid that if I moved or tried to get up, that all of a sudden my body would take me to the balcony and, and jump off. So what I did in that moment of crisis was breathe in, uh, you know, as deeply as I could and then exhale, but make sure that my exhale was longer than my inhale. You know, definitely, you know, in the midst of a panic attack, it can take some time to go away, but my body stopped shaking and I felt like, okay, like I, I am a little bit more in control right now. Um, and after a little while of doing that, felt centered enough to uh, go to the bathroom and I took a cold shower. Um, and, and that for me has definitely been a very grounding tool. Um, and yeah, just being in that cold water and, and feeling my hands and feeling my feet and being like, okay, I'm, I'm here in this present moment. And most importantly, I am in control of my body. I'm in control of what I do. And I know that I don't want to kill myself. You know, I don't want to die. I just want to stop feeling what I'm feeling. So, so doing those grounding techniques was super helpful. You know, when you're having a panic attack, for me, uh, physically shaking is when I know it gets really bad, cold sweats, um, and that helped my mind shift away from, like, I'm going to jump off the balcony, I'm afraid I'm going to jump off the balcony, to like, okay, I'm laying in my bed and I'm breathing, and that's what I'm focusing on right now, and that allowed me to be steady, you know, feel steady enough to walk to the bathroom, turn on the shower, um, and, and did some breathing in the shower, but that feeling of like cold water hitting your skin and, and, and hitting your body, um, is what is another like kind of mindfulness grounding thing. Like I, you can't really think about anything else going on besides like, fuck, this water is really cold. <laughs> like that's, that's my experience anyway. Um, and that can be super, super helpful. It was really, really helpful for me. I just remember like, okay, I need to get through the next second. Like all I need to do right now is get through each second. So thank you. And Abby's cat has decided to join us. I love that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to talk to you guys now a, a little bit about what your favorite DBT skills are and, and why that is. So some of this we've captured on video, but since we have you here, we have the experts here, I'd like to, I'd like to hear from you. Um, so let's see. Um, what <laughs> What about for you, um, Natalie, what's one of your favorite DBT skills and maybe a little bit about it, like what it is? Oh gosh, one of my favorites is um, 
I forgot the name of it, but it's distracting yourself when you're in a crisis. Um, I, I love it because you can just escape from this world and then go into your own little world where, where there is like no problem or anything. And I just love to watch really funny YouTube videos. Um, it can range from really cute, funny videos to really hilarious um, prank videos. Um, and also a good source is playing video games. I really enjoy doing that. And I, I think anything that distracts you or even going on a walk or a jog, um, anything that distracts you from what you're, what you're thinking of is, in my opinion, my favorite. And I think it's honestly the best skill to use. So distraction, that's exactly what I call it, the distraction skill. Yeah, the distraction. <laughs> Um, it's not the technical term, but that's what I call it. Okay, great. So the things that you can do to like take yourself out of that moment for a little while. And I love that one of her videos we're still working on, Eddie, is she just lists all the different examples of things that she uses to distract herself with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. So for you, Abby, what what comes to the top of the list for you in terms of dbt skills and, and maybe say a little bit about what it is so, so sorry abby before that when we're talking about dbt skills for those of you that aren't familiar uh, this is dialectical behavior therapy has a whole like hundreds of coping skills that you can learn and we're going to talk about very specific coping skills that these folks have found most helpful our experts have abby what's true for you um, hmm. I really like, um, I think today I really like radical acceptance. Um, I think that skill is really helpful when there's something really difficult in your life that you have trouble accepting or coming to terms with. And it's kind of, um, I'd say it's a heavy skill. Like, that skill isn't just going to happen for you overnight. It's going to happen over a, a span of time, a span of time. And it's going to be a lot of work. But when you come out of it, it's worth it because you've accepted something that's really difficult. I like the emphasis that you put on how radical acceptance is like a practice and it's something you have, especially for big things you have to do every day. I mean, would you agree, Abby, that it's like um, the idea with radical acceptance is that you, you know, you're accepting the, the facts of what is, even if you don't like it and you kind of stop wrestling with that and you, you say, okay, well, this is, this is how it is. Would that be fair? Yeah, it's pretty much just like an extensive thing where you just kind of go, well, that sucks, but this is reality and I can tolerate it and it's going to be okay. Yeah, did, um, were there particular things that radical acceptance was most useful for you in your, your life, like that you were struggling with? Yeah, so I have a lot of like issues remembering my childhood and I think that that was something really difficult for a while that I just like couldn't remember my life um, and I just had to like radically accept that like I might never be able to remember those things and like that's okay like I'm still alive like I my life is great and I don't remember those things and that might be painful at times but I can definitely like tolerate that pain and it's not gonna like kill me like you can tolerate all kinds of distress and come out the other end totally fine would you say that there's a like a step in radical acceptance that helped you get it down like something that you thought oh that's that's it you know or a piece of it that I think that like a lot of the radical acceptance that I've done has been like a process and a lot of times just like taking like time out of my day to think about something and just like think about that thing for like 10 minutes and then 
by the end of it, I'm usually in a different place where I have, like, an idea where the next step is for me to go. Mm-hmm. Like, I have, I have an idea, and I think usually the idea leads me to, you know, a place where I can make a decision about how I'm going to feel next and like the next step in accepting I guess. Do you mean like you're you're kind of sitting with the facts of the situation and by sitting with it without fighting it then you kind of get ideas about next steps? Is that what you mean? Yeah so just like thinking about everything that I know and then kind of being like well I feel like this about it now but how I want to feel about it in the end is this way so what how do I have to like wrestle with this to be able to feel this other way about it? Okay. There are good things and bad things about a situation. Like it's not, it's never all bad, but you kind of just have to like sit with it and like think about it in different ways. Not just like the one way that really sucks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Excellent. Um, Floro, for you, what's your favorite or what's one of your favorite DBT skills and what is it? Um, my favorite DBT skill is probably, at least one of them, would be cold, like Lily was talking about. Um, for me, I generally use ice packs and I put them over my eyes. And I find that that really helps calm my body down and distract my mind a little bit. Um, and I can practice being really mindful of those physical sensations and observing that rather than staying caught up with whatever's going on in my head. Um, and just being able to direct my attention to that kind of helps me get through that crisis or high level of distress that I'm experiencing. And I think that's one of the biggest ones that helped me stop self-harming because I think for a long time, I thought that the only way to like get past those urges was to follow through with them and then I would get some sort of relief afterwards. But that really helped me recognize that like, oh, there are other ways that I can deal with those urges and wait for them to pass without following through on them. And once I was able to really recognize that, I started being able to, I guess, just focus on how I wanted to live the rest of my life and how I wanted to make my life feel worth living. So just like very practically, um, how did, what did you use for cold and like, did you do anything to make sure you, it was available? And, you know, if I wanted to do it right now, what would I do? So I usually use an ice pack and at home I have a lot of ice packs in my freezer, but when I would be in other places, Like in high school, I used to keep two of the like instant ice packs that you can buy like at the drugstore that you like break and then you shake them and they get cold. I used to keep two of those in my car and then like one in my backpack so that like if I was ever somewhere where I would have an anxiety attack or be in crisis and I wasn't at home and didn't have access to the ice packs that I have here, I could still use that skill. Um, or literally using ice, like holding that in my hand has been really helpful as well. Thank you. I, um, didn't know that about you, that you had the breakable ones. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that is such a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Very helpful. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I am going to show, um, now a video of Abby. Um, we're on the ice theme. I have to say doing this series with them, with our experts was super helpful because I got to see like which ones tended to rise to the top. And I would say cold and ice, um, uh, excuse me, cold and opposite action worked quite um, a bit for folks. Those were uh, near the top. So let's hear Abby talking about cold. I used an ice pack to shut my emotions down. So one time I was really anxious and having a really hard time focusing, concentrating, 
you know, functioning. And I had a friend and they gave me an ice pack and they said, put that on your forehead, hold your breath, um, stand up and like kind of bend over and, um, you know, count to 30. And I did that and I sat back up and it really felt like my emotions were lowered. Um, and I was told later on that that actually helps, you know, regulate your emotions, bring them down a little bit, but it should be used when you're like having a panic attack or experiencing really intense emotions. Okay, so the first step of the process of the ice thing, the cold thing is you take the ice pack, you put it on your head, like on your forehead, a little bit above your eyes or like even on your eyes, just in that region. The next step is you stand up and then you gradually bend over and then you hold it for 30 seconds and you hold your breath for that 30 seconds. When I first heard about this little trick, I thought they were crazy. I did not believe them. I thought it was dumb. And then I tried it and I was very wrong. It does work, it does help and if this particular one doesn't work. There are different ways of doing it, like cold bath, cold shower, just anything cold. So I think when I first did it, I remember it just feeling really cold and my mind sort of was pulled in by the coldness and I was focusing on how cold it felt and just kind of how soothing that is. And also just you know, I felt like it pulled me out of my head for a second and I was able to calm down a little. Thank you, Abby. That was awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, so the video series includes this combination of stories about how I went through this hard time and then here's how I use the DBT skill. And then it, sometimes it's like, here's exactly the steps to take to do that. So if you guys have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. We want to hear from folks um, and our experts, our um, young ambassadors um, are open to your questions as well. Um, so the next thing I wanted to ask you guys about, um, let's see, is Um, talking openly about sharing suicidal thoughts. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, has it been- I think that Oops. getting help is one of the- Has it been hard or has it been easy to, to talk about having suicidal thoughts? Um, let's start with that question. So I'll, I'll let you start, Natalie. Um. For myself, it was extremely hard at first because I have like literally severe social anxiety. I really care about what people think of me. Um, and uh, through DBT, I o kind of overcame that social anxiety. Um, and um, I just learned that their opinion doesn't matter of me or, or their opinion doesn't matter what they think of me. And then um, I was like, okay, uh, I'll just talk about it. And, you know, when I was younger um, and I was in that position, I would want to hear someone around my age kind of speaking out about it. Um, and then I can relate to it. So I kind of looked at it as, um, just, I, I really looked at it as um, it's not about me. It's more about helping others. And that's what I want to do is to at least help one person. One of the things we would talk about before we did the videos is like, who are we speaking to? So I know when I get really anxious before a presentation, 
uh, it really helps to remember like who's the person that I want to hear this that this message is for and then everything kind of falls away and these guys really got that (laughs) yeah Flora um for you you know talking about suicidal thoughts openly was that a hard decision to make and has it been hard to do I think that I felt more comfortable talking about it to my close friends at the time than I did to other people. But once I started to actually work through them and get healthier and really enjoy my life again, I felt much more comfortable talking about it openly to other people, Um, people that I'm friends with but not as close with. And now I think I talk to people that I'm not even friends with really about it. Um, because I think one of the biggest things for me was just knowing that, like, there were other people in my situation who maybe didn't have people to talk to about it or people who they knew who, like, struggled with the same things and were able to work through it. Because I, when I was experiencing suicidal thoughts a lot, um, I had a fair amount of friends who we're also experiencing anxiety and depression and self-harm and suicidal thoughts. So I had people around me who I knew were dealing with the same things, but a lot of them also didn't know how to deal with it. So none of us were really able to truly like help each other. And so now that I know how to deal with it and I got through it on my own, I feel more comfortable talking about it with other people who I'm close with, but other people in general, just knowing that, like, this is an example of someone who understands those things and knows what you're going through and has had experience, like, dealing with it and actually getting through it. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, So, Abby, for you, was, did you have reservations about talking openly or sharing your experience, and what made you decide to? Um, Absolutely not. I am a very open person, but not only that, there's a lot of stigma that comes with, like, this territory, and to, like, squash that, I think everyone should try to, like, talk about their mental health more openly, and um, just, like, share, like, I feel like a good starting place even is when someone asks you how you are instead of lying if you're not doing good you say you know what I'm struggling right now and like I would really like a hug or like just telling people exactly how you feel and um yeah I feel like and that's a good place to start with that and I think coming on here was just um first of all it was really fun to like get to do the whole shooting day and then also just like talking about this stuff was really you know interesting getting to hear other people's thoughts on it but then just you know getting to share my own experience was pretty cool too because I didn't realize that it would have like an impact but thinking about it now it's like oh you know what the things I went through that was a big deal And the fact that I was able to get past them, also a big deal. And so here's the crazy thing. I should talk about this. And so it was very cool that I was given the chance, that we all were given the chance to, like, yeah. Um, I think sometimes adults, you guys are adults, but um, older people have uh real concerns um about you know people sharing their experiences openly and um and uh, you know there are there are reasons for that but i also see like it's going to be the young people that save us um you know with their willingness and bravery and you know just taking steps to make an immediate impact um so i see that's what you guys are doing Okay, the next topic, um, and this may be why some of our people are here. Um, the ne- next topic is like how to be a helpful friend or family member. 
um, because sometimes it doesn't come naturally. So how to be a, um, a helpful friend or family member. So we're gonna watch a video of Flora's, um, but I'm also gonna give her a chance to, to answer that a little bit. Um, but for you guys, you know, what does it boil down to? And, and maybe let's start with what not to do. Let's start with that. Okay, so who wants to go first? Like what's one thing that just isn't that helpful that people do? Yeah, go ahead, Abby. Okay, so I think that whenever someone's trying to talk about something difficult, you shouldn't say anything until they're done telling their story or like the things that they want to say because you don't know where the story is going to go and you don't know like where they're going to end up and if you just interrupt them and like say something judgmental or harmful unintentionally they might not tell you like the full thing and it could be harmful to them so just like sit there and listen and take it in before you say anything. Awesome, thank you. What about you, Flora? Um, I talk about this a little bit in the video, but one thing that really frustrated me when I was experiencing these things was when people would be like, it's okay, like, it's going to get better eventually. You just got to like wait it out, you know, like it will get better sometime. And I was like, that doesn't help me because it really sucks right now. <laughs> and so I think like hearing things like that was like pretty invalidating because it's like my brain is already telling me that like it won't get better. And you saying that to me isn't really going to change me feeling that way. And it, it can feel pretty dismissive of like the reality of your emotions in that moment, because even if, even if at some point you do know that it will get better, that doesn't make it any easier to tolerate it in that moment. Thank you. And we'll dive into that a little bit more too in a moment. Natalie, what, what do you, what's one thing people, that hasn't been helpful for you, that hasn't been helpful for you? Um, I personally have been very blessed to have very supportive uh, family, especially my parents, um, my family. So I never really experienced any of it. But one thing that I've seen is some people say it's all in your head or people don't validate your feelings. And that is one thing that isn't um, helpful at all. It could be rather more damaging than healthy. Great. Um, next question is um, about like what what's something that's been helpful or what what's something that surprised you that was helpful that somebody did. Um, whoever wants to go first can go ahead. Um, something that has been helpful um, that someone has did, um, for example, with my parents, they um, whenever I felt a certain way when I was like really sad or depressed or even very anxious I would I would usually go to them first and tell them how I felt and then just having them listen to me and um kind of I kind of like how they listen and they both are kind of like a sponge they like soak it all up um, no matter how um <laughs> how upset I am they just soak it all up and then they kind of squeeze out the water um, by giving me advice, uh, really good advice. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, what about for you, Abby? Like a specific thing people can say that helps or do? Um, Honestly, I feel like there's not like really a universal thing that I've heard because like sometimes when I'm in a really emotional state and someone's validating me, I'm like, like I'm, I don't appreciate it. I'm, I'm too emotional. I'm just like, oh, that's not advice. That's just validation, like whatever. And I think sometimes the best thing is to just listen and just be like, I hear you. Um, 
I'm here with you right now. I'm listening to what you're saying. That sounds really hard. So like validating in a way, but like a meaningful way, like not just a way that you're just like saying something to get the person to be like, okay, I'm okay now. It's just like, no validation when you really mean it. And it's like a strong, like you actually listened kind of thing. Thank you. Um, Flora, I'm going to show your video and then if you want to make any comments afterwards, that would be great. And then we have a couple questions from those attending, which we will pay attention to too. One of the things that really helps me when I'm in a crisis is when someone's able to help me just kind of put things in perspective and remind me that moments like that are temporary. You know, they're just a moment and it's a short experience and it's not going to last forever. And so when I'm able to recognize that as something that's temporary, it's a little bit easier for me to focus on getting through just that moment without having to tackle any of the bigger issues going on. You know, sometimes when I'm texting people, what really helps me is when they just say things to me like, let's just focus on getting through the next 15 minutes. You know, a lot of times when I'm having really heightened emotions like that, it doesn't last more than half an hour. And so when they just say directly, like, this really sucks right now, like, let's just focus on getting through right now it helps me kind of break things down and feel like things are a little bit more manageable and that I can actually take those things on and work through them rather than sit there and just think about how long everything's going to last and feel like I'm super trapped in that experience and that feeling. I'm usually only at a genuine risk of hurting myself for a period of time that's not more than 30 minutes. So when people are able to just talk to me and focus on getting through that short amount of time, it really helps me focus on what I can do in that moment and how I actually can cope with what's going on. I think it's really easy to think that messages like, this won't last forever and things will get better with time seem very similar to let's focus on getting you through this moment. But I think there can be a pretty big difference, you know, talking about how things will get better eventually and it won't last forever can feel like a bit of a lie. And <laughs> it kind of makes it seem like what you are feeling and thinking in that situation, like isn't real because it, in those moments, it does feel like it's going to last forever. But being able to tackle specific things like, let's get through the next 15 minutes, doesn't feel like you're saying it won't last forever or, you know, you don't have to dwell on it too much now because things will get better eventually. It feels like you're finding something genuinely manageable to tackle. and. When you're talking about things as a short period of time and just getting through that moment, it feels like a more direct way to address the situation. And when you're just talking about the grand scheme of things and how things will get better eventually, it doesn't really help you get through that moment. But if you, as the person who's trying to help someone in that, are able to say, this is what we're going to do right now. And I'm going to help you get through right now. It feels more like something that you can actually get through. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. So would you add anything to that, Flora? Um, I think. Yes. So there's another DBT skill that's a crisis survival skill called cope ahead, which a lot of times you use for like a specific situation where you think you might experience like high intensity emotions, but 
I think it helps me just in general when I'm at a more like level emotional state and like in a state of mind where I can think a little bit more logically and sensibly to think about the things that would help me in those situations so that in those moments I'm not I guess like so I'm not just trying to scramble for like anything that would work and I actually know like these are the things that work for me and when I get in this situation and when I experience these thoughts like this is what I'm going to do and that's how I'm going to get through it. Thanks that helps. I think um, that super practical like going back to the video piece of like hey let me help you get through the next 15 minutes boy, if everybody knew to offer that, um, things could be a lot different, I think. Um, we had some really great questions for you guys. And um, I think one of the, um, so Yoquin is, um, has worked in peer support. Um, and one of the questions that he had is about, you know, do you guys still have suicidal thoughts? And if so, what do you do? Um, because, you know, learning DBT skills actually doesn't mean you're not going to have thoughts again. Um, I think it just means you know what to do, but, but I, I defer to you guys. Um, Flora, you're nodding. What are you thinking? Um, I haven't experienced suicidal thoughts in a while, but I think what you just said um, is the best way of putting it, is that, you know, like knowing these things doesn't mean that you're never going to experience things like that again, but it just no it means that you know how to cope with it and you know how to deal with it more effectively. And I think like once I learned DBT, it didn't stop immediately. I still had suicidal thoughts. I still had urges to self-harm and things like that, but I was more able to kind of effectively deal with that. And one of the things that I think did help me stop having suicidal thoughts and stop having urges to self-harm was just knowing that like I actually can tackle those feelings and emotions and thoughts and like I don't have to let those things last forever and I actually am in more control than I think I am because I mean one of the biggest reasons that I think I felt suicidal and a lot of people feel suicidal about is just like thinking that it's never going to get better and just like not wanting to deal with that level of pain anymore. But when I learned how to deal with those heightened states, I think I was more able to process those as like temporary experiences so that I knew that like there were times that things would be better and even if I didn't feel like actually happy, like there were times where I felt more stable and calm and I could identify those and find ways to make those moments happen more often instead of feeling suicidal more often. Yeah, it's like you had more control of, of the situation. It still might absolutely suck. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it um, felt more manageable. Yeah. Abby or Natalie, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, Flora basically covered everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, I actually haven't had a suicidal thought in like two years uh, before or sometime um, like during DBT, I literally learned so much stuff about all the skills and everything to deal with that. So, um, knock on wood, you know, uh, hopefully I won't have a thought anytime soon, but it, it, it allows me to cope with everything. So it's, it's really helped. Thank you. Okay. And, um, this next question, see if one of you wants to try and answer it. So, how did you know you were struggling with more than depression and your thoughts were serious and could be harmful and you needed more help? How did you, how did you ask for help? So we do have a video series um, that does, that talks about how, how they 
got to uh, go about asking for help. So tips on that. Um, but if anyone wants to answer, were you able to recognize you were heading into a danger zone with your thoughts um, and that you maybe couldn't stop before you had the tools you have now? Could you tell what was happening before you had the tools you have now? Anybody want to take a crack at that? Um, I feel like before I had the tools, I couldn't even like diagnose the emotions I was feeling or why. I feel like that with DBT, I've learned how, like why I'm feeling a certain way, like what the emotion is, and I think a lot of that has to do the way in which DBT um, kind of teaches you what emotions feel like in your body. So like the sensations that come with emotions and then like all of the kind of, if you're living like presently, um, you, I feel like kind of, are in the moment more and so you're like oh if someone said something and then it made you your heart drop and then you're like oh my heart dropped because this person said this thing and you're like oh my feelings were hurt because they said this I am sad like it has helped me a lot to realize that like emotions come with sensations and so there's like a physical pain sometimes with the emotions that I don't think I really ever considered before. Such a good point. Um, and you can start to use those as like indicators, right? Like red, red flares. Um, we had a couple other questions, but um, one was about if there were any particular apps or online support groups that have supported your recovery or things that you would recommend to somebody who doesn't have therapy. Um, of course, Now Matters Now has videos of people talking about DBT skills and has an online um, course. Um, but anything else folks would recommend? No? We got a ton of just really supportive messages from folks and, um, uh, and just thanking you and just being in awe of you guys and just your willingness. And um, so I think we just, we want to say thank you so much. And um, you are now honorary United Suicide Survivors International members. <laughs> we've, we've adopted you. Um, so thank you for spending your time with us this evening. I think your expertise will go far and wide. I'm gonna pass it back to Sally. Do you guys wanna say, say wave bye? Don't, don't get off yet though. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah because she had some things she wanted to say and then I'll close. Thank you, Sally, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, I am a suicide loss survivor in 1998. I lost my very best friend to suicide. She had been 21 years old for six days. And I have spent nearly every day since then trying to figure out how we can change this. Believe it or not, I'm going to date myself. This was before there was even such thing as the internet. Um, and so I'm really grateful that we have the capacity for things like Zoom um, and email and all of those things. I want to say that I think this panel tonight proves to us, I hope beyond a shadow of anyone's doubt, that young people are brilliant. And that if we give them the platform, if we give them the opportunity, they have the ability not only to speak for themselves incredibly eloquently, but also to teach us. One of the pieces that tonight really brought up for me is the importance of being trauma-informed. And what that means is instead of asking someone what's wrong with them, asking them what's happening to them. Uh, and I, I see these young people who talk about the things that have happened in their life. Abby talking about not being able to remember parts of her childhood and the sadness that that creates for her. And Natalie talking about being bullied in school if we ask young people what's happening to them, they can tell us. So as adults, I think it is long past time for us to understand that young people are the experts in their own experiences. And I really wish that we had known that when my best friend went through all of her struggles. I can't say that I was surprised to lose her because she died on her seventh attempt. And we did not do any of the things 
that we are now hearing from young people are so important to them. So I want to thank Abby, Flora, and Natalie for coming and teaching us, and hopefully all of the adults will have the wisdom to believe them and their knowledge and experiences. Um, also, I want to ask all of you to join us. And when I say us, I am ref referring to United Suicide Survivors. We need you. We need your stories and your voices and your passion. We need you to make meaning of your struggle, whatever that struggle has been. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Sally. Cool. Yeah, I, um, I'm so inspired by all of you. I can't tell you how many times I got chills here listening to all the things you were sharing and your powerful stories and, and then reading the chat on the side of how everybody else listening in was so moved. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your courage. Thank you, Ursula, for bringing these incredible young women to us. Um, and I'm so grateful for all you're doing. Um, next month, we have a, another webinar that's uh, kind of a, a, a cool twist on our important topics of lived experience. Um, this is Skip Simpson. He's a lawyer. He's the lawyer that uh, def, um, supports families briefed by suicide and, and sues hospitals for negligence. He calls himself the suicide lawyer, and he puts lived expertise in the center of his practice. Um, so he'll be um, really inspiring for us as well um, as we put this to advocacy work to make sure that we get better suicide care. So we'll see you next month. And uh, thanks again for our panelists. Thank you, Ursula. And thank you for everyone who tuned in today. This will be posted on YouTube soon. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.